Hello, welcome back to Think Tech. This is Crystal on Quok Talk. Today, we're going to be talking about travel in Asia through a colonial lens. Now, what does that mean? First of all, I am still in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong was colonized by the British, if you didn't know. And, you know, in reference to Hawaii, of course, you all know, I hope, that uh, we were colonized um, by the good old USA. So what does that mean for travel? You know, back in the colonial times, what did it mean for the Westerners to come to Asia? And, you know, how did that affect the cultural diversity or the tensions or the bonding, whatever you like? So I've got a wonderful guest today to share all that historical information with us. So um, let me introduce my lovely guest. Vijay Verghese is a journalist, editor, and entrepreneur who began his career as a newspaper reporter in New Delhi before spending the last 40 years in Hong Kong traversing the region with various travel, business, and news titles. He relaunched the Business Traveler Asia Pacific as editor and publisher before starting his own regional magazine, Holiday Asia. And he went on to found the first Asian online travel agent, Smart Travel Asia, which turned 20 this year. Congrats, Vijay. So yes, not only is he a very well-versed in traveling, he's a Music guy, I know, photographer, designer, writer uh, for many papers. And so really, really a pleasure to have Vijay here to uh, introduce Traveling in Asia with us today. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to be with you, Crystal. Yes, it's nice to be virtual and yet in the same city together because, you know, in these most modern, postmodern times, I have to throw that word in there, you know, I, 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 I know it's really it, it, it's curious our times. You know, when we used to travel, I used to use this. That's a huge Rand McNally road access. You know, you know, we used to use that to navigate. And, and now we're using Zoom and, and Google Maps and you know, what have you. Yeah. Right. Nobody knows how to read a map anymore. Do I, I'm old enough to remember <laughs> fumbling through the maps um, in the car trying to figure out where we're going. So yeah, we're going to yeah. go way further back than that, right? So, BJ, Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but but maps is where it all started. I mean, I need a map to get my bearing wherever whenever I travel to New City, I'll open the map and I get a fix on my hotel and the point. And I'll check the speed so I know where I am within a certain grid or or, or by, by, by space. And and maps is where it all where it started, you know, from ancient navigation maps to to maps uh, inscribed drawn on parchment paper by the early travelers, adventurers. Navigators. So people started following those routes, so the routes of commerce along rivers and across oceans and then across continents. All started with maps. And these were physical maps because unless somebody had been there, nobody knew whether it existed or not, or whether it was fake or whether it was real. Or, because travel was mixed up with so much mythology in those days. Of course, nowadays life and politics is all mythology, there's nothing real anymore. But but in those days, travel was, was, you know, part legend, part the abode of the gods, part, you know, you're going to fall off the ed edge of the sea, you fall off the map. Right. But when you say they, who are they? I mean, when we're talking about the first colonial travelers to Asia, are we assuming the West as in Europe and... Yes, yes, Europe yes, yes really broadly, broadly, uh, uh, Western travelers. The travelers are traveling from everywhere. So, for example, one of the... The great early travelers was a Moroccan uh, traveler. Well, he would be called Maghrebi from the desert, but North Africa, Ibn Battuta. And Ibn Battuta wandered about in about 1325 uh, uh, AD or thereabouts. And he wandered through Asia, North Africa. He uh, wandered through, he arrived in India. He went to Southeast Asia. And uh, Marco Polo did uh, something similar. Following in his father Nicola's roots and his and his uncle, he went with them, and that was in 1271 or so when he met up with uh, Kublai Khan. I mean, that period, 1271 to uh, the end of uh, that century, and he met up with Kublai Khan and uh, came back with amazing stories about his, uh, his journey. As did Ibn Battuta, and as did people traveling in those times, there was such curiosity in meeting foreign visitors, that they usually had an audience with the king, they had audience with holy men, and, and so on and so forth. And they were quizzed about their backgrounds, their lifestyle, the clothes they were wearing, the food they ate. But how did they, where did they stay? History. I mean, did they have a concept of a hotel back then? Or did they just stay with other people? 
you know, how did the local people receive such travelers at the time? What do you well, think? Well, the hotel concept started a, a lot earlier with the Persians, um, also the Chinese and with the Indians. I mean, the Mughal, uh, the Mughals in India had these great roads, the, the Grand Trunk Road, which went from uh, what is now Bangladesh, Bengal to Kabul. Uh, the Qin Emperor had a had a huge highway that went from Shanti all the way north to Inner Mongolia. And the Romans were great uh, road builders, as were the Persians. And as in the Mughal instance, and in the Persian instance, Iran, that is, um, these routes had caravans arrived. Sarai's obviously places to sleep and rest. And the caravan arrived, then became drop-off points for the post. Uh, not quite the Pony Express, but a similar version in, in the east and the rest of the world where the horses would go down and the king's mail had to, his word had to be set. So the caravan arrived, slowly became places uh, for, for accommodation, looking after the horses, uh, uh, refreshments, um, picking up supplies and so on and so forth. So it started with that, a uh, very rough, rudimentary, and it followed the road. There. When he went off the road, there was no no caravan uh, to ride. So the Romans also had this concept of holidaying in summer to go up to their, their villas, their summer villas. They went up to summer villas in the hills. At other times of year, they went down to villas on the coast. The Mughals in India, as, as the things everywhere, did the same. In summer, when it got too hot in India, they went up north into Kashmir. Right, same as the and Chinese, they, right? The emperor had the summer the palace, and they had all that. But these were within their own country. But for the, we're talking about the Westerners who came into these countries, and how did that change and shift? You know, the cultural dynamics between wow, who is this new exotic person with different color hair, <laughs> and what kind of foods are they having, and why are they coming and wanting to go come to our women? You know, like all those things that come with that cross <laughs> cross pollinating <laughs> intersections. Well, well, travelers in those days were a, a rarity, unlike now. Now we've got to put so them they, back. And, oh, don't yeah. take the language, don't change the thing, everything. But, but in those days, travelers were a rarity, and people were curious. And uh, well, they were no mostly privileged that, royalty then, right? They weren't like your local villager who would even well, travel. Well, they were travelers, and they were merchants. And, and as in uh, uh, Marco Polo's case, he was a merchant traveler. Right. Okay. And in the case, he was a sort of a historian and a philosopher and so forth. Um, and these chaps then actually became emissaries of the various kings they met, you know, and then they went off on further travels as ambassadors. Marco Polo for Kublai Khan came to India. Ibn Battuta for Muhammad Tughlaq, who was the mad king of, of Delhi at that time, went off as emissaries. I mean, that's how valuable they were. That's how trusted they were, because knowledge was at a premium. And when people traveled, people realized that, wow, I didn't know this. And tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. Yeah, yes. But the travelers were very welcome. And when Nicolo, uh, sorry, when Marco Polo and his dad and others, and Ibn Batuta and Fania and, and uh, um, uh, Yun from from China, when they traveled, they stayed at the same caravan Sarai. And uh, the caravan Sarai concept became a waypoint and in, I mean, sort of like motels of the of, of yours, because you followed the roads. You wouldn't find a motel that was not on a river or not on a road. It had to right. follow an artery of commerce. Right. And the hotels followed the commercial routes. Uh -huh. So when the colonizers came into, I mean, uh, travelers, you know, the Arabs were traveling well before, Chinese were traveling, Phoenicians were traveling, they, just, they went on both. That was commerce as well. They right. follow the monsoon, they follow the wind, and avoid oh, wow. the typhoon. And basically, that's how travel travel works. I mean, in the days of sailing ships, you could only sail in a certain direction when the wind was right, and then one year that's later, interesting. You come back. so nobody thinks about that traveling with the wind. It just sounds so um, traveling with the wind. Um, what were be. they most then? Obviously, where were the men with with women traveling then too, or when did the women start traveling with the men um, during the colonial periods to Asia? Women started traveling too, but uh, they started traveling more as sort of, I hate to say, with goods and cattle. You know, they were looking after the upkeep, uh, sorting out provisions. Uh, in the early days, uh, merchants, adventurers uh, didn't take women with them because the journeys were far too dangerous. And, well, they, uh, they couldn't have their fun like they do today, where the men travel on their own. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure they had their fun, and I'm sure they had stories to tell, which we still never know. But uh, no, because but I want women, to insert that. I mean, 
These are centuries later, BJ, but I wanted to just kind of insert that image of the yeah. traveler to Asia, even today, where a lot of Europeans and, you know, just Western travelers go to, the, to Asia to assume this exotic, erotic adventure, especially to places yeah. like Southeast Asia, right? And so how did that even become to be, you know, these images of the West? Was it because of the early colonists who came over, who brought stories of these, wow, think about these old, wonderful Oriental delicacies and delicate women. And then these stories kind of turned into what we still have as this concept of Asia today, in some sense. No, no, very true. I mean, I mean obviously, uh, Asians are sort of more... Uh, are slim uh, and they, they, they don't put on weight, they age very gracefully, you know, ladies have long silken hair, all the rest of that. So all this was very alluring to people who came from the West. Yeah. Now, interestingly enough, uh, among the first ladies who traveled uh, intercontinentally during the British run, uh, the East India Company had to find uh, uh, wives for the people who were working with them and, and the military establishment. Now, until the age of 30, the, the people working with the East India Company were not allowed to get married because work was too, too uh, you know, diabolically difficult and, and dangerous, and they had to be committed to what they were doing. And in England, a woman who was over 20 was considered on the shelf, that means past her celibate So the mothers were going frantic in, in, in England. So the East India Company in the 1670s or thereabouts uh, brought over 20 young women and gave them a stipend of 300 pounds, which is a fancy sum by today's money to be about 60, 70,000 pounds. And they brought them for a year to go husband hunting in India. So while the husbands were hunting tigers, the women were hunting husbands, the men <laughs> tigers, and they were caught turned up. And they were known informally as the fishing fleet. The, the fishing, fishing fleet. fleet. Fishing fleet. They came fishing for husbands. So uh, it's different to what the Westerners are doing in Asia today, finding an Asian wife. That is so so, so did they women, find suitable husbands on this trip? I, I, I think many of them did, and and uh, some of them uh, just took the option because they didn't want to go back and be so be they were called returned empties. That was the term for them when they went back. But the fishing fleet became a very famous event where all the girls brought out and paraded, and they were sent to clubs and balls, and, and, and you know. Very, almost like taxi girls in Vietnam or lobster girls in a massage parlor, but in, in more tasteful circumstances, and they'd have ballroom dancing and they try to pair off with somebody. So that's yeah. the European women who came in. Some of them stayed off, became men tied, then married men who sort of had a lifestyle like a Maharaja and they became queens. Yeah. 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 Like the Borneo, they were the white Rajas of Borneo. But the women came later. So as okay. the men came across, um, you know, you know, the East was very exotic for a number of reasons. I mean, not just the people, but for its spices. Um, spices, of course, the trade. So in Banda, in Indonesia, in eastern Indonesia, the island of Run was the only place where nutmeg grew naturally. And oh. nutmeg was such a prized commodity. Uh, the, uh, the, the British actually had a, had a toehold in Banda, where the Dutch controlled Indonesia. And the British really wanted uh, other other things, and the Dutch really wanted to control all of Indonesia. So they they, they pressed the British to, to negotiate with them to give up Banda Island and run. And they did a trade, and they gave the British Manhattan in New York. Now, you just think of the implications of that. And the British got Manhattan from the Dutch, and the Dutch got the Nutmeg Island. And that, uh, Amitav Ghost in his lovely book, I think, Curse of the Nutmeg or the Nutmeg's Curse, he talks about how the West came to Asia and started what he called terraforming. That means turning Asia into a likeness of the West, because that's what always happened with colonizers. You went back and you, I mean, it happened in the US. I mean, uh, Europeans came across. And for them, uh, the mountains, it was all with, with, with to space. It was dangerous, it was hostile, it was, yeah. it was, uh, it was heathen. Yeah, God had fascinating. Put them so they yeah. had to, they had, that was, you know, the white man's burden that Kipling wrote about, which everybody hates this for. But what he meant was that they had a civilizing role and they went and created a little Europe in USA. So what they did was they killed out the natives, they, they pushed them in reservations, the ecology changed dramatically, 
they introduced the animals that were not uh, uh, native right. to the U.S. Right, and right. the same thing happened in, in Asia. Where they so started wait, okay, so point. this is all this trade that has kind of brought the Western ways to um, foreign lands. Well, all over the world, all over the world. All over Africa, the world. But if we're concentrating yeah. on Asia, um, I just want to say, you know, like, I'm going to just zip through like centuries just to compare to the past. So it sounded like back then people were there for trade, for curiosities of things that they didn't understand. But then at what point did it start turning into what we know travel as today? As in some people want to just go and sit on a beach and go to a fancy resort and not care anything about culture, just stay in their bubble in a nice hotel versus back then when it was really kind of a genuine cultural experience because that was the way of travels. Yeah, yeah, that was happening all all the time. So along this continuum, um, hotels were beginning to develop and so on and so forth. But I think the big change that happened was in the uh, the period between the Napoleonic Wars in 1871 and the First World War in 1914, the Belle Epoch in Europe, when they had the first era of peace, which was unheard of in Europe. At that time, the Swiss, I mean, the, the celebrities started traveling to Switzerland to enjoy the alpine air and spas and, and wellness and so on and so forth. And because celebrities wanted things to be, you know, just so, luxury hotels came into being in Switzerland. And the Swiss being uh, perfectionist and, and wonderful uh, hoteliers, which they still are because they have the legendary hoteliers, so things work like clockwork. So the Swiss took that and raised it to a totally different level. And mm. since then, people have been going to Switzerland to learn at Swiss schools to learn the art of hoteliering. And now, over the years, what happened is the Swiss, and later on the Austrians and the Germans and so forth, they brought their hoteliering knowledge and supplanted it in Asia. They planted it in Asia. The right, they the took their concepts kids. over, and they also hired Western people to run those top-notch hotels, they right? Did. They did. To reinforce they did. their they did. comfort. They right. Yeah. They, they so, wanted the knowledge and they wanted the professionalism. So they brought in the people from, from the West. And also and because most of the travelers were the Western privileged people, so they're catering to that, right? So then that also reinforces the discrimination against the non-Western travelers who happen to be there, who may have probably, you know, I imagine even today when, <laughs> when you know, people of color go to certain fancy hotels, there is still that lens on, okay, well, can you pay for this? What kind of background? You know, there is that 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 kind of discriminating um, instinct in a lot of there top-notch is, hotels. There, there. So can you tell us a little bit about that and how kind of that Western privilege kind of played into that whole concept of this hierarchy of travel? Well, well, the, the first great hotels in, in this part of the world, uh, maybe there was the Grand in Calcutta. This was all late 1800s, early 1900s. Then there was the, uh, the, uh, uh, the E&O started by the Starkey's brothers in Penang. That was the first great grand hotel, um, the, the Armenian brothers. And then they went on to do the Strand in Yangon and the Raffles, Singapore. Ah, I yes. I the hotel. You know, Singapore mm. had made the Singapore Spring, and that, that's still an iconic drink. I mean, yes, I don't think yes. That long, the long bar. Was it called the long bar? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the long yeah, bar. With yeah. the peanut shells and all the rest of that. <laughs> yeah. so, so that's when these great hotels uh, came in. And all these hotels were managed by Swiss, Austrians, Germans who had gone to Swiss schools, and they did it the Swiss way. And in a sense, what was happening was uh, they brought with them prejudices. Uh, I mean, not, I won't say prejudices or discrimination. It just happened that way. It was a cultural difference. They had a different way of observing things. It became a prejudice at a later point, and then they crossed over. And essentially what was happening is that the precision of Swiss uh, hotelier, like much as in their watches and so on and so forth, came into Asia, and then it married with Asian hospitality, which was very warm, and that created something in Asia, the Asian hospitality ideal, which is something the world strives for, because hoteliering and Asian hospitality is unrivaled, is unrivaled, both in terms of the quality of the product and the quality of the service. But I think even till today. Still today. But yeah. along that continuum, that, that, that continuum, as you went from the early arrivals going up to the great hotels like the Peninsula in Hong Kong and uh, you know great hotels in, in Hawaii, um, they were slowly adjusting to the, the Asian or the, the non-Western milieu. Now, I've met several hoteliers uh, 
over the last 40 years, uh, 25 hotels, all very nice people. But in the early days, in the 70s and the 80s, whenever you spoke to a hotelier and say, you know, where do your guests come from? You would say very proudly, my guests are all German and American and English. So the idea was I had no brown people at my hotel. Of course, the owners were very happy because, as you said, these westernized or the western travelers brought money. They were yes. the money starters, so they had, had the cash. Yeah. So the hotels followed the cash, not necessarily the color of the skin. Well, the yeah, cash. so exactly. So look at Hawaii now. It's small, you know, it used to be Japanese, but now the Chinese are coming in. And exactly. so you know, they're the ones who are spending money, and it's a very interesting kind of a reversal. No, I yes, it is. It is. It is. I mean, I mean, in other places, I mean, the Japanese became number one, then the Koreans became number one. I remember flying through Guam at one point in the uh, 80s, maybe, and uh, Japan was obviously the top customer, and, and, uh, and the Japanese were being ripped off left, right, center. So it was just money. And the duty free at the airport had in English certain prices on one side of the aisle, on the other side in Japanese, and all the Japanese ran there because it was in Japanese. Is your 30% more or 40% more? I mean, it's blatant, blatant. Yeah. And we were laughing. We said, Japanese, just buy here. And they point to the sign in Japanese, they were more comfortable. So, I mean, people have treated people of all color and all nationalities since time immemorial, even in Marco Polo's time. I mean, yeah. But even it's, today, can I share a small story? But when I used to travel yeah. to China with my husband, you know, yeah. we both have U.S. passports. But at that time, there were an increasing amount of local Chinese women who were you know, catering to the Western um, guests who are traveling yeah, and checking yeah. into these hotels, and they're trying to yeah. crack down on these women who are going into these rooms with these men. So here I am looking Asian, and I go in with my <laughs> husband to check in. They see our passports, but they still say, I'm sorry, she can't check in with you. So, you know, it's really interesting because they're a smart, their assumption is seeing me as an Asian as a potential maybe prostitute because that's was the norm of these Asian women who are hanging around these nice Western hotels, right? So there does that that lens on that kind of cultural expectations from the local side of what the Westerners would bring in or might want to indulge in. I don't know. I think it's really interesting. Well, well, well that practice is dying out, I'm glad to say. You know, yes. obviously, you don't look like a lady of the night by any means. Uh, your father is <laughs> well, that you. lovely, lovely as you are. But uh, even in Vietnam, and I, I understand your China example, but things like that happened to me. I walk in with staff and they say, no, only you. I say, hang on. We're going to a meeting. <laughs> this is my team. Or in Vietnam, where uh, Asian women married to, to Westerners are yes. barred in the lift and told, no, you have to register separately and say, you know, I'm the wife. So there, there's all sorts of thinking about, thinking about this. But that's dying out because that was the local cultures beginning to figure out what's happening. But all this is done with the hotel's connivance because all the, 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 the ladies in, in on and slipping in and out at night and all that is all done with the hotel uh, connivance. I mean, but they make them register separately and they turn a blind eye. They don't charge you for a night. Yes. All that happens. Yeah, and yeah. that's how the hotels made money. You know, right. uh, and, and I'll give you an example. So I don't know the name hotels, but, but let's say the Grand Hyatt in Singapore, which is a hotel everybody knows. Now, the Grand Hyatt in Singapore, I mean, it's not a naughty hotel. It's a very nice hotel. It's just coming for a, a remake and will relaunch next year. So it's, uh, it's fabulous place. Um, but one of the things that brought business travelers to Grand Hyatt, Singapore, and this is true of many places, you mm-hmm. know, Jakarta is lots of hotels, Shangri-La and others, they have these night, nightclubs. And Grand Hyatt had the bricks, which had rhythm and blues music and very good music. And we all went there after, you know, after we work to have a drink and socialize and move on. But then these places attracted uh, working ladies. Uh, as, of course. At least the new community refers to them as, and they're quite well dressed and speak English at all. So they come in for a drink, and and uh, these clubs don't mind if ladies come because when the ladies come, the men come too. Right. And when the men come, they then prefer to stay in a hotel close by, if not this hotel itself. Yeah. So to so this this cycle of action and interaction, they said no more women. We're getting tough at bricks. They shut it down. They block women. And you know what happened? What? The guest of the hotel plummeted it. Right. I was going to say, it's it directly sex, desire, pleasure, travel, intercultural mixing all comes together under the name of capitalism. Like everybody, it's all about the business, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> that's how we, that's what hotels started, right? It's all about the business. So yeah, in our small, 
Yeah. So Thailand okay. is very big, very, very big for that. And uh, unfortunately, so because there's so much more to Thailand. But I mean, that has become a big thing. I mean, everybody goes there for a bachelor party. Yeah, and, no, the sexual uh, industry is a very interesting, another topic that we, I would love to indulge in that for just a, a whole nother show, right? Maybe we, we should, can do that another should, time. We should, that, that, but in our short couple of minutes left, how was your, you know, if we're going to bring it back to context to today's travel, you know, you yeah. mentioned off, off air before that even the management is slowly shifting. You see people from their own countries representing higher management now, which wasn't a case before. So how do we kind of look, look at travel in Asia and how colonialism has impacted how we see travel today? Okay, again, partly it's the passage of time and people are more educated, we've grown up and we know more about our world. And partly it's capitalism, again, it's price, it's cost. So if a hotel can hire a cheaper GM, they will. And at one point, uh, it was fashionable to, to uh, go to local countries, other parts of Asia, because you could get someone cheaper than a Swiss person or an Austrian or something. I mean, I'm not saying that that is policy. Uh, I mean, that, that would be rude and presumptuous of me. But ultimately, just as in hotels, all of a sudden you've got uh, Asian servers and all the good in Singapore, suddenly local people don't want to work as waiters or waitresses. So you employ the Filipinos. And they're, they're, they're such good hostesses. And, and they're terrific. Then the Filipinos become expensive or they're, uh, you know, the Chinese are cheaper. So they're bringing mainland Chinese because they speak the same language that they fit in. But those ladies are also like the fitting police are looking for a husband. They come into Singapore and they, they charm everybody, but they all have an agenda. And yes. uh, at a certain age, everyone wants a boyfriend or a boss. So that interaction is happening everywhere. But in hotels in Asia, yeah. with the advent of uh, Asian general managers, and not just Asian general managers, maybe women general managers. And right. maybe general managers have completely changed the tone of things because they operate in a very different way. They brought EQ to the, the operation. And hospitality is all about relationships and about people. Yes. And what the Westerners were very good at doing was keeping their cool and managing situations. Yeah. EJ, losing. sorry, we're, we're, I'm sorry we're to break you off, but we're out of time. But you have just mentioned so many important aspects of the evolution of travel and how you incorporated the different kind of communities, different cultures, different genders that have kind of modernized the uh, concept of traveling. So I uh, appreciate all your insights um, into this. And hopefully we have another chance to talk about other aspects of tourism. But really appreciate this conversation. I hope people take away this kind of boundary breaking historical changes of the concept of tourism with a colonial perspective. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me on. Thank you, Crystal.